and it was just not very visible. And I know that with the telescope, it would have looked really nice. Yeah, I think the, the sensors are, it's really tough at that end because uh, it's mostly bright and it depends on how the image is stretched. Yeah. Um, you have to be kind of careful where you put the tones, so to speak. And the sensor, if, it, if you don't have like, I don't know, if, if you're stacking, I guess it's okay, but uh, no, it's better to have 16 bit. It's better to have six, yeah, okay. So you're better off to have a 16 bit sensor if you can, and then be able to do the dynamic stretch on it. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. I kind of, I, I kind of only look at the gross features when I see stuff like that. Like I look for the, the hard edges around the Terminator or the, the edges along the side. I, I think uh, Bill noticed that about the image I took with uh, Zyaritis actually, uh, the, the edging on the, on the crescent, which is kind of cool. I was surprised at how well they were able to pull up features right across the the disc so that that is with my telescope i don't get much contrast whereas we did with the with whatever system that they were using but they did not see as much of the terminator as i would have liked what can i say it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know uh, it's pretty hard to beat the human eye for uh kind of um i don't know mentally or cerebrally kind of meshing all the pieces together. I think the thing with the pictures, Randy, is that you, it, it's very easy to control the, uh, the contrast range in a way that, I mean, I was amazed years ago, the first time I took a picture of the full moon and could see the features right across the whole face of it because I wasn't seeing that uh, through the eyepiece very well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But a polarizer helps a lot if you're going to be looking at uh, fuller phases of the moon. You can mm -hmm. pull the uh, light levels down so visually you can get close to what you can do photographically. Yeah, and when you view it as well, you know, if you're closer to dusk, um, you're going to level the uh, dynamic range a little bit because the sky is going to fill in some of the dark pieces. Yep. All sorts of tricks. Ken McGill, are you the person who was on Cattle Point a couple of weeks ago? You're, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, they're still muted, I think. There. Hello. Yes, I was. <laughs> well, that was really fun. <laughs> and, and, and Ken, Ken, thanks for sending along the Orion shot done with the ASI Air. That's, that's superb. Yeah, that's the one behind me. I took that the next night. I think I was down there, Randy. Yeah, or, that's cool. It was last Monday I was down there anyway. Uh, yeah. Looking good, looking good. It, that's it's pretty nice a for a very first, uh, my first one. That's yeah, really okay. nice for a first astronomical picture. Well done, Ken. Thank you. I had a question for the moon observers. Um, I <laughs> once looked at the moon through an H alpha filter, and it looks a little bit different. <clears throat> what am I seeing looking at the moon in an H alpha filter aside from reflected H alpha? You know, I, I wondered about that myself, Gary, because um, when I looked at the specifications of the SLU telescopes, they actually said that they use an H alpha filter for the moon. Oh, okay. So I don't know why, but uh, that's I wonder they, if it's just that. to bring the uh, intensity down. Well, but yeah, it's, it's red, right? H alpha I can't red. imagine that a, yeah. an H alpha filter would be very helpful for the moon, other than that. So yeah, just density. density. Dorothy said, when I went through all my filters and I found that the red and yellow were, were best, Dorothy gave a long talk about how that corresponds with her understanding of the rods and cones and, and resolution. Is Dorothy on? No. But uh, 
I mean, certainly you have to attenuate the moon. It's just too bloody bright. And there's something about that um, yellow to red part of our vision. It's got better resolution. Well, well you, you see, the, you see the, the same thing. The monochrome camera reds better, right? Yeah. So, I think it's the scattering, less scattering, maybe. Yeah, possibly. If you have a blue clock radio or a red clock radio, you can always see the red clock radio much more clearly as opposed to blue. It just looks blurrier. This is something about your ability for your eye to resolve detail. But even in, even on, I see bigger contrast on a red filter with a monochrome camera than I do with a blue. Blue's kind of, the contrast is muted. Well, certainly in the, in the 60s when we were shooting black and white film, red was the one that you used for hyper contrast when, when we wanted everything black and white, literally. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> wow. Kind of cliche now, but. If you wanted a black sky, you used a red filter, right? Yeah, a dark, yeah it darkens the sky substantially. Yeah. I think try, with try something or other film, I forget. Try X. Yeah, certainly the, uh, you get more blue light scattering in your cornea and your lens and the vitreous in your eye, for sure. Uh, and you can really notice that if you're driving down the road in one of those cars with the brilliant white lights is coming in your direction, you'll see that, that really makes a big difference in your lack of ability to see as opposed to the old style yellowish lights of headlights. It's one of the reasons why uh, older people don't like to drive because they're, unless they've had cataracts done, <laughs> um, that scattering can really be a, a disabling glare issue. Dave, I can't resist. There's a fly on your screen. And yes, it is. Un yes. Un unlike Mike Pence, it's not in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Dave is multitasking. <laughs> well, it, it, it just happens that uh, I sit in the living room to do these and, and I, I do a, uh, once, a once a week a fly tying demonstration thing with a friend of mine in Edmonton with a couple of, with people in the local fly fishing club here. Oh, you, so have, another doing... life. you have another life outside astronomy. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so we've been doing this uh, online, online via Zoom fly tying thing for the last year. And between my friend Florin and, and, and I, we've, we've probably demonstrated well over 100 flies now. Wow. And we get, we get about 20 people. Uh, one guy from Pennsylvania comes in regularly. We've got somebody from the mainland and a couple of people from Edmonton and Red Deer. And it's, uh, it's been fun. It's, it's, certainly, it's kept the, the local club together over this course of the pandemic because we can't meet in person so we do stuff over Zoom. So, so like um, Rask and uh, so many other groups, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, should we get started, everyone? Um, welcome to uh, Victoria Center Astro Cafe for uh, Monday, March 22nd. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. See, we currently have 28 people signed in, so that's great to see. Um, and I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that there is a star party at the observatory on Saturday. I'll uh, just share the information about that briefly. Um, you may remember Malhar uh, Ken Durkar um, joined us at an Astro Cafe, uh, I think about three weeks ago, and he'll be speaking at that. Um, the Zoom link is available. So if you go to centeroftheuniverse.org, uh, it starts at 7 p.m. and we'll try and get that on the website uh, as well. But uh, that looks to be an interesting event. So remember that is on Saturday. Um, a lot of things happening. Um, Ken, did you have something you wanted to share briefly as a follow up to your uh, items you presented last week? Yeah, I'll make it quick. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, then I'll share very simply um, what I'm, uh, <clears throat> there, sharing screen, yes. 
Does that work? Yes. Yeah, we All can right. see your screen. Okay, so um, last week there was a brief discussion about the Antikythera mechanism, and uh, sure enough, uh, APOD uh, had a, a picture of the mechanism that day or shortly after. Anyway, at the bottom of the APOD uh, uh, webpage, there are quite a few uh, uh, links that you can follow. And I suspect, like most people, I never bother to look at the links, but the mechanism kind of interested me. So by chance, I picked one of them. And the one at the bottom called Modern Computer Modeling is really quite interesting. And uh, uh, click on that. And you end up at a web page that's supported by uh, Nature magazine, you know, very good magazine. And um, on that web page, they present a, um, an, an excerpt of a larger article, a PDF, a, that blue bar on the right. Um, but it's really quite interesting, about uh, 14, 15 pages. Uh, explaining in terms of, you know, 2000 year old arithmetic, how uh, they estimate the uh, Greeks came up with the logic behind their, um, their mechanism. Uh, I don't think they figured out how to, it was machined, but uh, anyway, so I thought if anybody was interested in getting some uh, explanation of the Antikythera mechanism, um, uh, it's, the, as well as we know at this point, it is available um, via nature. And I believe that's a, you know, a copyright free uh, thing because the links are all public and they invite you to download a PDF. Um, a little sidebar there, uh, nature publishes a weekly newsletter. Some people might be interested in that. It's um, sort of excerpts of latest events in uh, their view of science. Um, it's, the excerpts are relatively non-technical, and yet they cover quite a variety of things, including astronomy and other things. So, uh, and it's a free newsletter, so how can you lose? So, um, oh, and the uh, last thing, where did Antikythera come from? I thought it was some ancient Greek word, probably is, but in fact, it's the name of a, an island somewhere in the Mediterranean. So that's all I have to say. Thanks Where do you much. sign up for the newsletter? Uh, you would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest you go to nature.com and it will be an option there. Yeah. It's a good magazine, but uh, you know the full magazine is often quite technical and detailed about things that uh, would not interest most people. Thank you for sharing that, Ken, because that's an interesting follow-up to... Uh, the material you presented last week. Um, so our main um, uh, event this evening is we, we are um, um, pleased to welcome the uh, editor of Sky News Magazine, Alendria uh, Brunhez, um, to, uh, who was the one who asked the question about finding these things, being an editor of, a, of another magazine. And um, uh, I'd like to welcome her and uh, yeah, invite you to say a few words to us, and then uh, I guess we'll see where where we go this evening. This is uh, as you probably see in a fairly informal group, so there's a lot of uh, questions and chatting and thing going on. So uh, yeah, but thank you for joining us and staying up late, as uh, it is quite late in Toronto at the moment. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I um, uh, and I also see Nathan there. Uh, Hi, <laughs> I um, didn't, uh, so I'm Alendria um, and I don't have any, um, I didn't really build a formal presentation. I uh, thought as this is a cafe, I would have my cup of tea and kind of be low key. Um, so yeah, I'm the editor of Sky News. Uh, I guess a little bit about me and kind of where I came from before I got to Sky News. Um, I'm a journalist and I've been a journalist for probably about 15 years now in a, a bunch of different organizations. Uh, what I have typically done in the past, and it's kind of become, I guess, one of the things that I do is that I um, go to places where they've been traditionally, like traditional media, so like print um, and 
or, or even sometimes like radio or uh, try to get them to kind of move into a digital um, digital way or just different types of storytelling. Um, for a while, I worked at a company called Scribble Live and it was uh, real-time storytelling. And so it's, uh, it's, I worked with a lot of different media organizations there and different newsrooms to try and um, help them tell their stories in different ways, use social media, um, tell them as the story's happening and do it in accurate and fair and representative ways. Um, and so uh, as with many people, um, astronomy's always been a part of, uh, uh, I guess, you know, who I am. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot, um, a, a lot. And astronomy was one of those things that I loved to, to focus on. And so, um, yeah, like I used to read, uh, I guess, textbooks back in high school, even though I wasn't taking any astronomy courses. And then, um, though my journalism tended to focus on um, kind of local, like when I was, working in journalism rather than helping other journalists do it. It would tend to be like local journalism, but I always seemed to find a way or tried to find a way to kind of incorporate um, science and astronomy into it. And then when the Sky News position opened up, I threw my name in the hat and now here I am. Um, and so it, uh, it, what I've been trying to do uh, as the editor is kind of in you know, going back and reading some of like the older Sky News um, and what I kind of thought that Sky News was there to do is to kind of inspire people and to get them to um, think about space and visual astronomy and just, you know, opening their minds to, to what's out there. And so I try to focus on how other people do that um, because I'm not, uh, I'm not a gear hound. I'm, you know, I have a set of binoculars and I don't like the cold weather very much. <laughs> so when it's cold out in winter, um, like when I was, I lived in Athabasca in Alberta for a while, you know, I'd drive around in my car on occasion with, you know, my camera to kind of like take drive by Aurora shots or, you know, it, it was, I did, I did not like to get out of the, the warmth. <laughs> so, um, but I like to see how other people do what they do. Um, so I brought with me um, a sneak preview of the uh, May, June edition. It's not the, uh, like I printed this off at the UPS office down the street here. Um, and also, I guess I should say, uh, currently I live in Collingwood, Ontario. Um, and at the moment I'm at my uh, partner's place in Vaughan. And so, yeah. I went to the UPS and got my Sky News printed there uh, so that I could edit it. This has a whole bunch of like, you know, red marker in it. Um, but I thought it was kind of relevant to what we were going to talk about or what I was going to go with today. Uh, because what I tried to focus on in this edition with Janine's help. Uh, hi, Janine. It's awesome to see you. And thank you for all that you've uh, done with this edition. Um, yeah, there you are. I see you. <laughs> so, uh, she kind of came to me a few months ago and said that, you know, she wanted to see some pieces about outreach. And I thought, you know, we should do a lot about outreach in this one. Um, because, you know, during COVID times, outreach has changed um, in the way that people are interacting with one another, like even like this, like this is, would we have done this, you know, a year and a half ago? I don't know. Would you have? No. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, we'd have been in a portable in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there's been a lot that has, has kind of changed. And so this, um, there are a couple pieces in here. This one focuses on some folks from the uh, 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 British Columbia centers. And yeah, we've got Bruce Lane in here too. Um, and I'm not sure if I, his name was up here tonight. Yeah, Bruce is here. Oh, hi, Bruce. Yeah, I know I'm here. I don't see. Oh, there you are. Hey. Yeah, it took a couple <laughs> minutes, hi, to get in here, but I made it. And yeah, then we've got this uh, story about, um, it's called Dispatches from Hawaii, 
And so it's Canadians who are in Hawaii uh, doing cool astronomical things and kind of we're doing outreach with the community um, and different people and the, well, basically different communities. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is kind of a special outreach edition. Um, and I guess that's what I'm also trying to do with Sky News is use it as a bit of an outreach tool. Um, like I have a list here of, uh, let's see if I can find it. But, um, kind of the ways that Sky News has changed over the past, I'd say year and a half, like it was, um, Chris Gaynor was involved in this whole process through, uh, there was a, a, I guess, what would you call it? A proposal uh, called Vision 2020. And through it, like there have been some massive changes at Sky News and the kinds of changes that, um, I can't remember who I was talking to recently, but I said that it's like the kinds of changes that every media organization wants to do, wants to see done and never does because they just think that it's too overwhelming. Um, but like, it wasn't like the changes have been on the back end. So the way things that you don't necessarily see, but like the way that like the customer and like subscriber tools, subscriber management tools, like we've changed those, we've changed, um, uh, marketing and delivery, like we've changed the printer, um, the branding, um, the the website, the social media strategy. Um, there have been some really huge changes and those aren't easy. And I know that they're not always appreciated um, and I can completely understand why. Uh, and I can also see why they, some like changes had to come into play too. Um, like, you know, we have an Instagram account now and we didn't have one of those before. Um, and that's a really key way of reaching out to people these days. And uh, yeah, so that's my kind of basic spiel um, about outreach. And uh, I hope sometimes it can be a little monotone. Um, so I'm sorry if I have kind of kept it at the same uh, volume and uh, uh, kind of note there, but uh, I, I might jump in and say say a couple of things. You really yeah. really brought, brought me up. We, uh, uh, you know, we had we had some we had some uh, great people on. We've had great people on staff all along. I don't mm -hmm. have any question about that. But uh, 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 over the last few years since we bought it, we we were getting into into some serious financial problems and um, uh, and it turned out we had some differences with the uh, with, with the previous staff we felt that we needed to and you know and this is this is not only what uh, the consultant who gave us our vision 2020 uh, was saying but various other people were saying that uh, that, that that we had to kind of get with uh, the fact that a lot of people uh, uh, look to online sources uh, uh, as well as or instead of your, your traditional magazine. And I think there's lots of people love the, the, having the magazine, myself included, but we had to uh, think about these other people and, and, and there, were just, there were just some changes that had to be made uh, in terms of the way things were being done to make uh, you know, make things, um, make the whole thing sustainable. Otherwise, it probably would have been gone by now. And, uh, uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, we, we made all these changes kind of in the, in the back end, but uh, it also led to us making changes at, at, the, at the front end, which you see, uh, you know, I got I got to be editor for one issue, which is I think mm -hmm. enough for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm talking about the readers, that is not so much me. And uh, and you know, I think uh, Alendry is doing a great job. You know, where where was it? Uh, just the other day, I was uh, I was reading something where where uh, or, or somebody commented that. Um, 
that, you know, while the Sky News that we had in the past was uh, was really good, it was kind of like a, a, a northern version or kind of a, a slightly different version of Sky and Telescope. And, and, and now, uh, now uh, Sky News is Sky News. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, and I and I give most of the, uh, most of the credit to that to uh, to uh, Alendria and uh, uh, and uh, you know, and I know the best is yet to come. So I'll yeah. leave it there. Hmm. Thanks. So, what is the best to come? Um. <clears throat> well, <laughs> we <laughs> I um. Uh, it's a new adventure every issue <laughs> like yeah I don't know like we I guess some of the things that I'm really excited about and excited to see continue are um, we've got Chris Vaughn who's writing Beyond Messier these days and I've been really excited to see the stuff that he comes up with and um, Ivan has been writing for years and I love the stuff that he writes and uh, Isabel, who's our art director. And this wouldn't, you know, the, the changes that have happened um, at the website and the magazine, um, like the look, like the, the actual art and the design that goes behind it, it's impossible to think of it happening without Isabel. And um, like, she makes it look really good. And so when she and Ivan, uh, are working like he comes up with a story and he gives us some content and when you see it in it's like raw form it's just like you know a word document and a bunch of photos and I feel so bad I'm like here Isabel is this like pile of paper uh, basically and she takes it and she makes it boom beautiful and like yeah when he like he's got such good stuff and then when it kind of comes together, it just, I don't know. I, it, it just, it sings, it, it tells a story. And so he did a perseverance uh, story for this, the May, June edition. Um, Blake Nancaro has also started writing um, and he did a story about the modern makers. And this was in the March, April edition. And I am really excited to see some of the stuff that he's coming up with too. Uh, because he's he's more into the gear um and that's like i said before that's not uh where my head sits um and so i like to see things you know that i don't know how to do and how somebody else can do it um and this one's the modern maker's story uh and so he like his story coming up in the uh, july august edition is going to be about you know ways to hack your scope uh, you know, how to do things without, uh, you know, spending a ton of cash. And uh, um, yeah, like it's going to be, uh, I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, Nicole Martellaro has been writing Beginner Sky. Uh, and this one I was actually really excited for too, the one that she just did, um, which was the it's it's urban skies like how to uh, enjoying the night from light polluted skies um and so i uh this was a fun little read and it's um i find that her beginner sky stuff is pretty good uh for people who are trying to learn to get involved and i just noticed that Lori's here too Lori roche and she's also in the may june edition of uh mm -hmm of Sky News, the one that I keep pointing to with the Jupiter. And yeah, I guess that's another Jupiter. Elizabeth Howell is a space journalist and she and I um, actually went to journalism school together. And so when I first got the position at Sky News, she was my first phone call, I think. And I was like, hey, Elizabeth, uh, <laughs> ah, <laughs> what, <do I> want <laughs> to write a story. And yeah, so she wrote um, about the Hubble Space Telescope, I think that was the first one that she did. And she also does a column now. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just very, 
I, but I love that it's like just watching this happen where it's like this Canadian space focus. Like, so it's basically, um, you know, things that are happening across the country and it's a, a good way to feature it in a national publication so that we can see that, uh, you know, there are, there's an amazing, or there used to be an amazing media program uh, based in Alberta and uh, there's an, art installation in Montreal that is focusing on the, um, the observatory at Mont uh, Megantic. And uh, yeah, like it's, I guess those are some of the things that I'm excited about that are yet to come and sort of in the process of happening. Well, Gary here, good for you. I'm the one that blurted that out. But I have to know who came up with the excellent motto, where earth meets sky. Chris, was that Paula? Chris, Chris you're, you're, on. Mute, you're muted, yeah. Chris. Yeah, the, the fatal Zoom thing. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it, it might well have been uh, uh, Paula. Uh, Paula Blacklock was the uh, uh, consultant that we hired and who kind of uh, uh, pointed us in the right direction when we were making 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 our changes and yes and I believe I believe we, we started using that slogan we re, we relaunched the website I think just before you you came Alandria mm -hmm. and I think that's where that was and then it was in the uh, it, it was in the issue that I did so it was it was uh, it was probably her I take no credit for it myself. It looks really, really slick and really good. Congratulations. Alandria, do you have a lot to do with the Canadian Space Agency? Have you got some good contacts there? Mm, uh, me personally? Mm, or I just, mean, I or, send them. Or Sky News, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, th I would say that we, yeah, sort of do. I mean, Elizabeth Howell is, uh, she's our writer and so she's, Basically, we use her contacts. Like she's the one; she's okay. contacting them and writing stories. Um, I'm uh, in contact with like their media room, I guess. So, I'm, okay, I've got their email. They've got mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to meet people now, though. So it's. Uh, I think I think Elizabeth is the one who has the. Uh... <laughs> The connections in just a minute. This is her yeah. whole new book of, about the Canadian space program. So uh, it's uh, it's definitely worth a worth a worth a look. Uh, and uh, because it's been it's been a, it's been a while since there's there's been a, a book on that topic. So yeah, she's been prolific this year. I think she's written or been an editor on like three or four different books. Um, there was one That's about right. Mars. She's, yeah. she's the, the co-author of a book about uh, sort of the search for life on Mars. And uh, uh, I see she's working on some other book with uh, Dave Williams who's one of the uh, astronauts. So yeah, no grass growing under her feet. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I have to comment that it's kind of interesting to see uh, on this modern Zoom environment, we're actually seeing people hold up bits of paper. <laughs> yeah. As a person that loves reading paper stuff, thank you. <laughs> you know, I um, like I've I I do a lot to kind of help or try to help traditional media organizations move to digital. But at the same time, I'm a sucker for print. Like I still get a Globe and Mail subscription and uh, I read it every week. Well, do the crossword and the Sudoku and complain about the crossword and the fact that it's like really American and not Canadian. Uh, but I love my print publications. What proportion of RASC members uh, pay for the print version? All of them? Yeah, I think like currently it's, it's the print part is of, what is provided, isn't it? it yeah. It's part of our uh, part of our membership fee. 
It's oh. the JRAS that you can elect to. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Is there some things that you have to pay for extra? Mm -hmm. Correct. Actually, with Sky News, it's the opposite way around. Um, Sky News, we get the paper copy, but if we want the electronic copy, we have to pay for it. Okay. Okay. Although I've noticed they just sent us a, an, uh, an offer for, uh, I think it was $5 or whatever it was, 10 15 mm -hmm. for the whole year um, of digital, which I am going for. So I'm glad to see that. Um, I'm uh, the opposite of John. I, I uh, don't like paper. I've gone paperless for a number of years. So I'm thrilled to see uh, Sky News move uh, online so that the uh, online presence is sort of leading as much as the paper copy. That uh, really is something I love to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that there's, there's, it's important to have both and that they accentuate both because it's like, to me, it's like, you know, some of these stories and the way that they are presented, it's like, you can't necessarily get the same effect on a screen, but at the same time, there's just so many different ways that you can interact with the story in better ways online. It's just a different, it's a different medium. Like there, there are benefits and there are negatives. Like I, I use my digital subscription, um, <clears throat> like I just, I use the search function. Um, you know, I constantly, like I'm in there every single day using the, the search for the archives. And yeah. I think that that to me is like one of the most, uh, well, A, like when you get the digital subscription, you get the full archival access. And so that's, uh, it's that search tool. Um, like a couple of weeks ago we did um, we were focusing on the Messier Marathon. And so I went and looked for all of reference, the references to the Messier Marathon in Sky News over the past 15 years or so. And that's where I found Warren Finley has done like, a, called it a, what did he call it? A bi-marathon or a dual marathon, something like that. But he did a, an actual marathon while running the, the Messier Marathon. <laughs> It all like he had just written in a little letter um but yeah he he did a video as well and he posted that online but he ran was what is it 42 or 46 kilometers and every once in a while he'd stop and look at the stars and then he'd go back and run it's that, a that great sounds video like Warren, all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you've met him you would know <laughs> well he wrote the 2000 ngc uh story yeah. a couple of months ago yeah I, uh... he plays he plays the oboe in the bagpipes <laughs> does he yes he's a real renaissance man in a lot of ways wow yeah well, Andrea, I, I hope you keep the paper version as well even though i'm very uh, uh kind of digitally bound for for my information um i mean layout in printed form is still an art form um mm -hmm. you, that'll never disappear i don't think Mm -hmm. I still make the our Sky News as if it was going to be on paper because I don't like hyperlinks. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard anybody that had a, an actual stand, public stand on hyperlinks, Bruce, but that's pretty funny. Cognitive um, switching penalty, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, it's just the black hole effect. You know, you, you get onto a one particular... Uh, site and you're going along reading and everything's going very well and then suddenly you click on a link and you've gone down this black hole and you're somewhere else <laughs> and i think that's part of the thing that you're talking about your objection bruce part, yeah, part of it even if you don't click on it though your brain is stalled instead of reading deeper your brain stalls and goes well what do i do now <laughs> oh, there's a penalty there <laughs> Uh, in psychology so you have to you have to sort of think of these things when you're writing it's like if you're if you're referencing a 100 page legal document good place for a hyperlink but if you're just say if you're just going to talk about something just talk about it i mean that's how i look at it well of course um the interesting thing is that sky news from rask victoria existed before sky news the magazine i think i don't know if anybody has any background on that um, well, I, the archive is is online, so 
on our website so you can go back and read whatever one you whatever issue you want yeah like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's like the victoria um, rough riders yeah Jan <laughs> janine janine on the original website we used to always talk about sky news and we always used to say uh our sky news or something like that to that effect well i have a question for alandria um you know, to, to me, like, I, I just think that a massive amount has been accomplished since you became editor, because you weren't tasked with really, um, you know, energizing, I, I don't know what the word is, revamping the magazine, but also these other social media platforms that is just, I just can't imagine the, um, the effort. And I really like how complimentary, I like I'm a Facebook user, even though I'm, you know, an older demographic. Mm -hmm. But I really love the complementarity of the uh, of those two, the print, print and the um, and the Facebook and the Facebook page, and of course the website. And I love that you get so much more use out of the content. You know, for example, mm -hmm. the Cam Whipper article has been on the Cam uh, the Cam Whipper speaker series. Mm -hmm. has been on the um, the website for months now. Um, I know it's the standard question, but in your year and a half. What have your personal big, big, biggest challenges been and your biggest rewards? Mm, biggest challenges and rewards. Um, I think, um, well, a challenge has been COVID. <laughs> like I started and my very, so our first edition was the March, my first edition was the March, April, 2020 issue and so we had prepared that it was out it was all ready to go um, and it went out and we were working on the 25th anniversary edition the May June edition um, and that was like a it was an anniversary edition at an organization that I was brand new to and then b it was like do we even put this out um because is it is it essential is this like there were all these quite kind of questions going on and like do we even have the ability to do this because this is it's you know always been done from a distance like the sky news team has worked across canada um, um i don't know if it's basically since its inception um and like it was but it was like a brand new team. We were all just trying to figure out the motions. And then all of a sudden this really big wrench was thrown into things. Uh, and it was like, I remember sitting in my room and I was talking to somebody and I'm like, am I like, what is the norm here? Like where, I, like, I don't have a bar. The bar is like, you know, normally here's a bar and I'm trying to meet a bar. The bar is like completely disappeared. It's like, you know, maybe on the floor somewhere. It's uh there's the bar is broken <laughs> it's, it was uh that that was definitely a challenge and then um we had some printer issues and mailing issues and some were COVID related and some were not COVID related it was just um our printer went under um and so we had to find a new printer at the very last minute uh, I think that was the uh, that might have been September, October edition. Um, and then, yeah, like it's been, that was, those were some of the challenges. And then the rewards are um, oftentimes comments from the readers who are, you know, happy to see the magazine exist in the way that, you know, see it exist the way that it does. Um, I, I don't want to, I guess, though you asked about rewards and so tooting own horn, I guess, uh, like I got one email from, and I can't remember the woman's name, but it was like, she said that she hadn't gone, like I wrote a column and I can't, I think it was July, August about paddling. Um, like I took my boat out to um, like on Georgian Bay and it was a bit of a, a wild ride and perhaps I wasn't as prepared as I should have been and um, but it was I made it around and here I am today um, that that was just luck and I you really should get some better training um, but she wrote that she um, 
like she wrote me an email and said that she uh, had been inspired by that. And she had actually taken her boat out paddling um, and she hadn't done it in years. And I thought, you know, nothing else happens. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm happy. I've done something at least, you know, I can retire in ease. So. Well, we're, uh, while we're talking about COVID, I would say that the last day in my life that I spent uh, without <laughs> yeah. it really being affected by COVID, it started out by having breakfast with Alendria. We, we met for breakfast at a, I was in that week where everything turned upside down. Uh, I was spending that week in Toronto um, visiting friends, but also doing some RASC work. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the morning after the uh, uh, pandemic was declared, I had uh, breakfast with Alendria. Uh, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then I went to the national office and did some work, which actually had nothing to do with uh, COVID. And then, and then the, the next day I was occupied with getting out of Dodge, you know, getting back to Victoria. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I'm always going to think of, uh, of uh, Alendria when I think of that week. And I think, I, I think we talked about it later on. And I, I think mm -hmm. Alendria said, well, that was a, the last time you'd been in, in downtown Toronto for months after that. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, I didn't. I, I haven't been down that way since then. Okay. Um, I've been on the outskirts and kind of looking from a distance and being like, oh, but uh, I haven't been down, down into the city. Um, yeah, that was the last time. And I took the subway. That was the last time I was on public transportation, too, because um, it was. Uh, and, and I remember everybody was kind of, you know, chuckling and. You know, I had my scarf on and I'm like, not taking this off, keep that face going. And somebody was like, you don't want to, you know, make a fake cough right now. Ha ha. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> like it's, it's, yeah. Good breakfast. Yes, it was, a, it was a place called the, the Senator, which has been around for decades. And it's uh, right near Dundas and Young, right, you know, right in the epicenter of all the action in downtown Toronto. So maybe 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 uh, when I come back, hopefully this fall, maybe we'll have to do it again. Kind of close it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get get the vaccines and then uh, um, the vaccines and then breakfast. <laughs> well, vaccine will be long before that, I hope. Yeah. Alendria, I've got a question regarding the length of the magazine. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any constraints uh, financially, how many pages you go? Or uh, does it just depend on the topics that show up in that particular uh, issue? Um, I mean, we've been keeping it around 44 to 48 pages. Um, usually if it's a special, so like the 25th anniversary edition was kind of a special edition and so tried to run it a little longer um and yeah it's it's a little bit of combination of both like if some big news is happening then uh, and we have a lot of articles i'm inclined to run a little longer um but at the same time budget constraints and it's you know, it's not only the printing job, but it's, you know, paying the writers, paying the editors to edit the extra pages, um, the designer to design the extra pages. So it's, uh, yeah, so there are financial considerations too. Very good. Thank you. And I, I like hyperlinks. <laughs> Don't get rid of yeah, I have to apologize. We've got some hyperlinks. Um, we actually had a discussion this edition about whether or not to underline hyperlinks or if we would just go with a bold or a different color. And we made a this edition decision to underline all of the hyperlinks except for those in the masthead. So my apologies for that. 
um, but we try to keep the hyperlinks to the end of stories. There are a couple in the middle of the story, but for the most part, they're at the end. Sorry, Bruce. It's just the gateway. That's what, how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> next, thing it next thing you become BuzzFeed after you do it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Top five lists. Yeah. So, Lender, you may you may detect there's some tension between Bruce and I because I'm I'm the webmaster and the uh, mm -hmm. the online uh, geek, and uh, he's the he's the guy that's still focused on paper. <laughs> but it's a friendly uh, competition. I'm a book guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I see Bill uh, about Instagram being owned by Facebook. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's it's. It's, ugh, there's I don't know if you guys have seen like the um, there's been a, a bit of a hullabaloo with news media Canada and post media and Facebook and Google and there's it's, it's, it's yeah some some noise going on and I uh, tend to side with the media because it's what I do Spacebook. Yeah, I like Facebook. that. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. I yeah, I think the, the big guys in uh, social media need some competition for sure. Mm -hmm. That would smarten them up considerably. They just, mm -hmm. they just buy it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, this is, uh, ugh. I've, not if it, not if it's fragmented, it, they wouldn't buy it. That's your that's your retirement model. Make something good enough to compete with some high big company stuff. They'll just buy you. That's, well, that's nothing happen. new, Bruce. <laughs> it's it's just, always been that way. <laughs> Actually, there are wonderful sites like Parlor that <laughs> yeah, you could just dump them down whatever sewer you could find. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a bit more about just the, the sort of mechanics of being an editor? Like, I don't really know much about that job. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you like article, do you, story pitches, and then what do you do with them? And um, how do you arrange them? And you sometimes go with thematic kind of issues, but sometimes non-thematic. And mm -hmm. yeah, and then the writers and I, just the sort of explanation of what, what do editors do? In particular, you. Sure. I mean, I, I guess my role is to keep my ear to the one ear to the ground and the other um, focused on what everybody's doing. I guess it's, uh, I try to understand what's happening or, and also thinking like, you know, maybe four months ahead. Um, so when assigning stories, it's thinking about what will people want to see in four months, um, as opposed to what's happening today. Um, and yeah, so that's usually what happens is it's a combination of writers getting in contact with me and me getting in contact with writers. Like, so for instance, Elizabeth Howell, um, she's, generally got her own story ideas and she'll come to me and be like, Hey, do you want a story on Juno? And I'll be like, yes. And, or she'll give me like a list of three or four different story ideas. And I'll be like, okay, well, this kind of fits better with this. And, you know, we'll kind of figure out uh, kind of a story map, if you will, or kind of a set of them for a couple of months. I've been, is a very busy guy like he's been he works at the globe and mail and um so for him he i think what he tries to do is kind of like if he's got a beat that he's working on he'll kind of work within that or he'll um like so perseverance it was um like he got in touch with me and asked if he could do that um Let's see, how did this work? This one was a bit of a funny addition. Yeah, because so you had approached me, Janine, about um, the story um, about the folks in Hawaii, as well as the one about uh, outreach 
in British Columbia. And so you got in touch with me and then I got in touch with um, Sahar who wrote one story and then I wrote the other. And yeah, Alan Dyer uh, often comes to me and when Alan says something, I usually just say absolutely because uh, he's awesome. Uh, Nicole as well, Chris Vaughn. Chris Vaughn just writes things and then I, you know, it sometimes they'll come to me with ideas and I'll be like, you know what? I really don't think that that works with like the other stories that I've got kind of in mind. Um, can we flip it? Like, I guess a couple of months ago, um, there was just some talk about like beginner scopes and a lot of folks were like, so Alan did a beginner scope story. Nicole did one. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a lot of beginner scopes, but we managed to do it in a way that, um, and we actually just put the other Nicole's beginner scope story online because the diagrams were not perfect. So my apologies on that, but it does address that in this May, June edition. Um, and so like, but it was, I guess, my role in that was to say, we don't want these stories to overlap too much. And therefore we need to make sure that they're different. There's either like a different audience kind of focus or people are getting something new out of it when they read each of those stories. Um, yeah, so I guess that's what I do. And also edit it. Like I go through the entire magazine and make sure that it, um, like that the stories flow well together and uh, spelling and grammar is okay. Um, it took a little bit of a, a little while to get our editorial team um, focused and kind of like, and, and by editorial team, I mean the people who are copy editing with me. Um, I think we've got it down pat, knock on wood, you know, and uh, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with this edition in terms of the, um, in terms of how it went, the, the editing process this time, so. Oh, Elandria, how big is the team or does it fluctuate? It fluctuates. Um, so this May, June edition had a fairly substantial team. Um, I've got eight people under the contributors section and usually there are only about six. Um, and in addition to them, I had a couple of uh, at least one, I think two, we had two other writers that wrote kind of shorter stories. And so I didn't have their, um, their names and photos here under the contributors um, section and the copy editors, we had one, two, three, four, five, six copy editors this time. And so they don't necessarily do the whole magazine, uh, but they'll do parts of it. And that's another part of my role is to make sure that every page goes through at least two or three rounds of copy editing um, before it's actually on the page, when it's on the page, and then when the whole magazine is together. Yeah, I, I, it, it's always a big debate with me whether I want to see the same faces uh, in the same writers in a magazine versus uh, the opportunity to have a lot of fresh faces all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I try to change it up a little. <clears throat> so it's I mean, Brian Ventrudo is now writing um, Exploring the Night Sky consistently. Alan is in almost every single issue. He said that his very first issue, I think ever, that he hasn't been in Sky News was um, the March-April edition. Is that the one? And he was, uh, no, I, he was in that one. So maybe it was Jan Feb. No, he was definitely in Jan Feb. Um, Nope, it was Jan Feb. He wasn't in the January, February edition. Um, we managed to get a few of his photos in there, but he was uh, kind of sad not to get a story in, but he was working on the, the Backyard, Backyard Astronomer's Guide. Um, and so he just kind of didn't have enough time to get something together. Uh, but yeah, you, you, I try to, yeah. I try you, to you, change up. You, you mentioned um, the... Um, production quality of the magazine as well, like maybe struggling with print and stuff. Are, are you happy with the current printer? Yes, yes, I am. Um, the printer before, um, you could tell things were a little bit, 
uh, like there was an addition I think we might have put out an apology afterward where they just completely forgot to mail the magazines and I was like how does this happen how do you forget to like they just had like 20,000 magazines sitting around in a storeroom somewhere I'm like how did you what <laughs> like, you, you know the re the lender the reason why I ask is uh, you know a decade or so ago uh, when Sky News sat with astronomy magazine and Sky and Tell I used to always brag that our magazine was the best, right? I mean, our print quality was the best, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when you compare it to Sky and Tell or Astronomy Magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, it's different now. Like, I think our paper, like we are going with, I think they're still going with a glossy cover and we're with a, a satin cover, um, which just means that it's less shiny. Yeah. And I, I prefer I, it. I, I, I like the satin actually. It yeah. doesn't have as deep uh, a black, but it's still mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, it doesn't have as deep a black, but at the same time, it doesn't reflect as much on it so that you don't end up with, so you, it's not as deep, but you see it better. Well, I, I took the flack for all that because the the one I edited was the first one that wasn't slick. So, uh, so that was all blamed on me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I think I think one other thing you did was, uh, you know, when the changeover happened, you came in and you kind of had to, uh, you know, uh, uh, assemble a, a bit of a new team. Uh, uh, I uh, I did a little work in that respect. Um, uh, I think one of the things I did was uh, 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 make sure we we hung on to Ivan, you know. Uh, we kind of got him through that transition. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And, uh, but uh, uh, and Nicole. Yeah, well, Nicole was just was just kind of uh, starting at that stage, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, um, I'm not sure how much credit I can take for that one. But uh, anyway, Alendri, I've got a question about nimbleness. Uh, uh, with rapidly changing uh, breaking news astronomy stories, how much lead time do you need to incorporate it in your magazine? Yeah, about that. No, I don't try to include too much in the way of breaking news into the magazine. Um, I try to put that online. Um, and then in the magazine, I try to make it more featurey. Um, so, or... Like it's, yeah, like I, I try to go with more of a feature piece, um, even in our briefs. So our Sky News briefs, if something's, um, if, if I think that something's important in terms of like, uh, so that Alberta meteor story, um, it's in the May, June edition because like it was the, um, they had an Aurora camera catching uh, the fireballs trail um, in, at Athabasca University. And um, so it was breaking news as it happened, but at the same time, it was like, I don't, I don't see it as breaking news, you know, when you get this in the middle of April, this story happened in February. Um, and yeah, so like we're putting this magazine out, today was the final like approval. Um, and so in order to get it into the magazine, it was, like I guess stories that were about a week or two, about two weeks ago. Um, and so, yeah, it's about a month, right? So you, Alindra, you have like a, you have a month really, a month gap between final copy and print distribution. Yeah. And that's not even like, that's, I'm a, like, I'll sneak a brief or two in, but I won't sneak them all. Um, so the briefs for the, for the most part, the magazines like already decided like right now, mid March right now, we're setting all the stories up and I'm going to get them in a few weeks for the July, August. Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, we're thinking really far in advance. It's just those little briefs, the Sky News briefs at the beginning of the magazine that I have a little bit more leeway with. 
Are you the editor for both online and uh, the print magazine? That must yep. be quite a juggling act. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> what is it? Spinning plates on sticks? And you just kind of have to run around and turn them? No, they would be active galactic nuclei, actually. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I can't, I can't, I hope I'm not, you know, taking up too much air time, but this is really interesting about the editorial or the story from an editor's point of view. Um, I really love the Rask spotlight. And my guess is that it's become shorter because more of that's online, I'm not sure. But I also really know that it's pri still primarily, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, very much focused on observing and astrophotography and um, those aren't my interests, but I consider myself a Renaissance woman and I like to think I you know, have diverse interests and I, I like diverse the d diversity of topic when it goes beyond those two, to be honest. Although I still try to read them and expose myself to the wonderful world that you other folks live in. Um, but any comment about thematic issues? That, do, you, do you do thematic issues? And also um, your views, because I've just got one, I'm just looking at the front page and the, uh, I don't know what you call it, but um, do you do any, what are your thoughts or comments on letters to the editor, that section? I love letters to the editor. They're great. I love getting them. The, the May, June edition. And, and I like them when they're critiques as well as, you know, praise. Um, I, I like constructive criticism. Without reader engagement. Yeah, love it. I don't even completely hate when somebody's like, you know, really passionate about something um, and has something to say about things. Um, I, I like there's this May, June edition has one, two, three, four, five, six different letters. And yeah, the, the one fellow, James La Framboise, um, he, said that our, uh, the beginner scopes, the three diagrams were, were wrong. And he like wrote, you know, a substantial piece there saying how they were wrong. Um, and I, you know, he's right. And so I put that in there. I think that it's important. Um, and you know, it, it makes us better, I hope in the future kind of pay attention to that and make sure that the diagrams are 100% accurate. Um, and yeah, like I really love letters to the editor. And I, um, in terms of thematic issues, I, um, yes. And like we've talked about doing like special issues for uh, like, so for instance, in astrophotography, issue um like around the time of the photo of the year like when we're announcing the photos of the year we could do a special thematic issue or like if there's a major event like a solar eclipse having a special solar eclipse edition um these are things that have been done in the past and you know can be there are grants and that are available so that we could do like an actual like supplementary addition to um, the regular six issues that we put out every year. Um, that idea has been tossed around, how it would happen. I don't know. I don't have that kind of set up yet or any thoughts about that, but um, I think that it could be a really great thing. Um, yeah, we, there had been some talk before COVID hit like it to do like more about travel. That was actually, you know, when the consultant spoke to me, she's like, we need to do more about travel and get more travel stories. And so my initial focus coming in was like, you know, we have to think about astro tourism. And then it was like, oh wait, <laughs> no, <laughs> we have to pivot really, really quickly here. Um, and yeah, like that May, June edition, um, had a story that was about uh, different site historical sites in Alberta. Um, and so the idea was to promote these places as places where a person could go. And it 
we really had to focus more on the history side of it. Mm -hmm. um, like these are great places that you're not going to see for a while. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And the Rask Spotlight? The Rask Spotlight is, uh, it's my understanding that it is, uh, like it used to be the newsletter, right? In the center of the magazine. Um, and so Sky News, uh, a lot of our readers are obviously RASC members. We also have to be cognizant that a lot of them aren't. And so we put the RASC section in there and I try to make it, um, I, I try to get the content from the folks at the RASC national office or from other RASC members around the country. Um, I try to make it something that uh, so instead of being kind of like a newsletter that's like this is what's happening it's like this is what Rask is doing um, and what you could be doing too if you were a member of Rask so it's a little bit of Rask marketing I guess um, that's how I look at it how do you guys like through times lens This is the one, it's in the Rask section. Um, and it's kind of the historical piece. Let's see, March, April edition would have had the um, Orion now and then. I'm always big on historical pieces. Yeah. When I first began, we were running them a little bit smaller and we've like, I think the first one was maybe like a little bit of a quarter page, um, but they've been getting bigger and bigger. And so I was just wondering if people like it bigger or smaller. I like more history. That's just my personal bias. I, I like doing the big historical pieces and also reading big historical pieces on uh, history of astronomy, mm -hmm. major interest. So many of us RASC members are getting older now that uh, history is, is more interesting to us, perhaps. I like history. Okay, good. I'll keep them half pages then, at least. I think the historical work is also closer to what the amateur astronomer can do. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're all very keen on all the newest gizmos, but when it was just the individual looking through the eyepiece and figuring out how the sky worked, that, that, that's a great period. And we can reproduce a lot of those original observations. Okay. Well, it's getting late for Elendria. Maybe we should uh, wrap up this part and, and thank you again for joining us. And um, uh, it's been very interesting to hear. And um, now, now you've uh, met her, uh, you know, if you have comments, I'm sure she'd be happy to receive them. And if there's other things you think of. Um, one thing we try to do, or, or we've been trying to do and gotten back into doing briefly is to look at the sky this week. And I don't know if Randy, if you want to quickly tell us what's on the website there, sure. um, just because we may get some clear skies, although today kind of fooled us a bit, didn't it? Well, this moon was looking just fine just before the uh, meeting. So uh, this is uh, what we have coming up this week. Uh, I hope people are watching Mars work its way across the ecliptic. It was very nicely uh, within a binocular view of the uh, Pleiades a couple of weeks ago. The point that they uh, are making this week is it's very close to its uh, red star twin, Alderbaran in Taurus, the, uh, the eye of Taurus. So um, what did they say? It's uh, seven degrees apart. So that's too far for, uh, for your binoculars, but certainly naked eye, you see the bright red Mars and the bright red Alderbaran um, certainly a favorite part of the moon for me is the, uh, Bay of Rainbows, the Sinus Aridum, 
And uh, so that's getting featured this week. Uh, so we're just past the quarter moon. So that, that's, yeah, it's a couple of days from now. Oh, my birthday. <laughs> and then it's a, it's a quiet week when they start talking about uh, just um, the stars. They, they, they actually say this, when the moon is bright and the planets are absent, then you can enjoy the stars. But it's a nice little uh, paragraph about Castor and Pollux. They're what's similar and what's different about the two of them. And then Sunday, we have the full moon. And boy, is any of our group able to see the zodiac light? I don't know if anybody has the dark enough skies, but. Um, yeah, probably not here. <laughs> Who, who in our crowd has even seen them? I have, uh, Randy. Oh, yeah, I think I've, I've seen them and I've also photographed it from uh, Southern Arizona. Yeah, yeah I, I saw it from the Galapagos. That's great. Yeah. And I was just reading, um, because the um, Juno um, spaceship going around Jupiter, is using solar panels rather than a nuclear reactor, which is like, it's the, it's the only distant um, ship that is going solar. It's got the hugest solar panels. And as it was traveling past Mars, um, the navigation cameras were seeing all these um, bright flashes. And what they were was meteorites banging off the the um breaking bits off the uh off the solar panels oh, wow. and because of that this was the biggest and best um monitoring of the dust that makes the zodiac light mm -hmm. and it turns out it is very intimately linked to mars and uh so there's a whole new understanding of the zodiac light because of the serendipitous uh, combination of this huge plate kind of plowing through these meteorites and the, the, the camera that was being used at the time to keep the, uh, the um, Juno pointing right, they, they have these flashes and, and it's a whole unexpected bit of information. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, so I think we'll um, we can let uh, Lendria go now. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, just wanted you to see that we do actually um, try and um, look at the online Sky News site um, weekly just to tell us what's uh, up there. So um, thank you for doing that. We appreciate it. And thank you for joining us tonight and telling us about what's going on. And it's nice to, you know, to be able to meet you at least in a, in a Zoom sense. Yeah, my pleasure. And yeah, if I just put my email in the uh, chat there. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, feel free. Um, and yeah, it's lovely to see you all and meet those that I've met before in other contexts and meet the new folks. And uh, yeah, have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the talk. Bye. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know if, um, I think that's probably, uh, we probably make that it for this evening. Um, we have a couple of things that uh, are on deck already for next week, and John will be our host next week. Thank you, John. And um, we'll, uh, yeah, uh, we'll convene, convene then. Just a reminder again that the uh, friends of the DAO have a star party on Saturday night. Uh, and we'll let you know if anything else comes up in the meantime. Oh, um, one thing I did want to share very quickly, let's see if I can find it again, is there is a repeat presentation through UVic. Um, who was that now? I, sh I meant to, I haven't got that. Where are we here? There we are. Um, so uh, Wilfred Buck, who is um, an elder uh, from, uh, where is he from? Um, anyways, I think he lives in Alberta, anyway, or Manitoba anyways. 
he uh, did a presentation that was very um, people were very enthusiastic about, and uh, he's actually there is another talk by him on Friday, March twenty sixth. So we'll try and get that on the web page. Uh, we'll be uh, on a YouTube stream, and there will be a chance to um, submit questions for another uh, uh, site. So if anybody's interested, he's from uh, Cree Nation in, and he attended the University of Manitoba. So if you're interested in that, he's uh, going to be talking about uh, night sky stories uh, from, uh, I think, with the, uh, from the perspective of the Cree. So. His presentations are really cool. Yeah. So it's probably worth uh, seeing if you can do it. And we'll try and get that on the website before uh, Friday. So keep an eye on the uh, victoria.rast.ca and we'll try and get some things up there uh, to remind you what's happening. Uh, remember too, that uh, if you aren't receiving them, you can sign up to receive the weekly emails from RASC National. Uh, for those of you who are interested, the moon at noon will be starting in a couple of weeks. And that is uh, an attempt to work together as a group on doing the uh, introductory moon lunar observing program that Randy did previously. Um, and they've planned it to be done in, I think, about four months. So, uh, which I think is doable if the conditions warrant and allow. Anyways, unless anybody has anything they wanted to bring to the attention of the group, maybe we'll call that uh, a night this evening. And yeah, uh, Chris, just maybe just yeah. one quick note. Sure. Um, when I was uh, looking for uh, Uranus last uh, last week, I I noticed a, a star he had occulted. So that made me start looking. And there's actually an occultation in April 23rd, which we might want to get involved in for those of you who have not actually noticed a occultation before. So more more to come in the coming weeks. Yeah, if you could put something together about that, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. David, are you still looking for someone to do some star curve, light curve measurements? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna start. Oh, I, I should mention this. I, I did meet with my mentor with the AAVSO and uh, I had a really good chat with him. And I'm, I'm just trying to get my telescope together, the go-to system together. And um, I'm gonna call him back. So I'm gonna start doing some oh. stuff. So if you're interested, just kind of drop me a line. What sort of equipment do you need? Uh, actually, amazingly, not too much. Uh, I was a little bit worried about having to get photometric filters, but he told me I can just use the LRGB filters. But I, I can tell you that more offline. Sure. He just dropped me a line. OK. Great. Well, there was, uh, oh, sorry, there was Bruce, one thing ahead. I wanted to say about uh, last week's session, because I'm, I'm doing the write-ups as I'm trying to get caught up with this. Uh, for next next sky news uh, gary did a thing on the astrolabe that was found in the shipwreck i'm pretty sure that came from a uh, treasure ship from lucullus uh there were about four of them i think that sank that were overloaded uh, mithridates in his Sinope palace had one and it was referred to as the ball of bilaris um, it, as, as it was like inventoried off the major items that were taken or sphere of bilaris that was inventoried by the Romans when they sacked his palace. Do you, do you um, think there was more than one of them, Bruce, or just was it there unique? was there was one about less than probably half a century earlier that the Romans again smash and burn, grab thing, what the Romans do. They uh, went into uh, Sicily and to Syracuse, and that was where Archimedes was. Uh, war machines were defending the city, and they took one from Syracuse as well. And that was that one was taken probably. Uh, less, probably around 50 years, maybe a little more than 50 years after the one was uh, stolen from another Greek colony in uh, the Black Sea region, Greek colony. So there was another one stolen. <laughs> That's how the Romans did. They're, they're like a smash and grab biker gang, essentially, with a big army. That's what they do. It's the basis of their economy. Uh, so they, they stole one, the Syracuse one about, I guess, probably 50, 60 years earlier. And then they stole the next one because Lucillus was working on his pension plan at the time. So he was completely looting Asia Minor. And that was the one that was stolen in uh, uh, Sinope. I believe it was Sinope Palace. They, um, there's some, if you look on Wikipedia, they sell it with Sola, not Lucillus. 
Wikipedia is wrong. Solo was dead for like eight to ten years before before that was looted. So uh, they're not Wikipedia is not always perfect with history that way. So you'll get a guy who does. I'm an expert on this part of history, and they'll just throw some thing they found somewhere without doing the proper research on something they're not as you know well studied on. There's a really good book on it. Um, Adrian Mayer, I believe is the name. She writes a lot of stuff. She wrote The Poison King. It goes into some detail on it as well. That's a really good book if someone is interested in uh, Mithridates. But I just thought I'd throw that out there because uh, I threw it in. I threw a big editorial note into the uh, write-up about it, so I thought it was worth bringing up because I like the history. Very good. Okay, well, uh, if that's it, um, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and we'll uh, see you next week. Yep. <laughs>